watching News Click, and today we're going to be talking about the latest in the vaccine situation across the world. As we know, the vaccine distribution and vac the delivery of vaccines is highly unequal. Some countries of the global north, uh, they have really vaccinated their populations at a very high rate, whereas many countries in the global south still struggling for supplies. And in between, we have a situation where uh, India is not able to get some of the essential raw materials needed to ramp up the production of vaccines. And US officials have said that this is right now, uh, right now not their top priority, that the top priority is going to be the US population. So to talk about these issues and more, we have with us Prabir Prakash, sir. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. So my first question is regarding net prices statement, the State Department spokesperson who said that, you know, right now their first priority is the American population. And this was in response to the question of whether India's requests for you know, uh, waiving the Defense Production Act and allowing supplies to come to India would be accepted. So how do we see this response in the context of the global scenario? You see, it's also interesting that this response has come after first denying there is an export ban on intermediates or vital uh, equipment that are basically required in the production process. That's filters, back filters of specific kinds and so on. So. Initially, the United States had said there is no ban, but what they did not say, and that's the half of that statement is a problem. What they did not say was that they were privileging their own production, which meant their companies had to get everything first, and therefore others had to wait in line. So this is essentially, uh, what shall I say, uh, whitewashing something that they were doing, or it is just prevarication, it's lying, you can take whatever you want out of it. But certainly, it was hypocritical to claim there is no export ban, while not allowing exports to take place to other countries. So that is one part of it. So this statement at least has accepted that yes, we are privileging our own production, and then goes on to also add certain, what shall I say, white lies, lies, uh, whatever you want to call it, by saying that US will protect its population first. That's what they've been saying right from the beginning, that this is the aircraft issue, uh, oxygen masks descend, you fix yours, then give others. Well, actually oxygen masks descend for everybody. It's not the descend only for the first class and then it comes to the second class or the club class, whatever you want to call it. So that apart, the, here the issue was that the second part of the statement that we privilege ourselves first, but they also said it's a huge boon to the rest of the world because the United States then will be able to control the virus within its own population. Therefore, it will not spread virus or mutated viruses will not spread from the United States. But what about the rest 7.3 billion people outside the 7.4 billion people outside the United States? Do you think their viruses will not mutate there, that it will not come back to the US. So the whole argument, if US protects itself, it will actually help to protect the world is completely bogus. And that comes out very sharply in the statement. So the reality is it's a completely hypocritical statement. In fact, if we look at the figures that I'm now seeing, that the US would probably successfully uh, vaccinate the people above 18 years by say June, that it or so. So if that is so, then up to June, they're not going to export any vaccines. Will they then allow at least intermediate goods to be exported, raw materials to be exported, filters to be exported? So all those question marks remain, but is the whole world 7 billion people, 7 plus billion people supposed to wait till the United States has vaccinated itself completely. And if new mutants arise, will US itself be safe? So that is the question which the uh, global health experts had said from the beginning, either everybody is safe or nobody is safe. And I think that's a fundamental tenet of public health which is being broken here by saying we'll privilege US over the rest of the world. And I do know that in India also similar calls are now being given. But the whole point is, of course, we are in a huge crisis, but that crisis is not going to be solved by hoarding vaccines for ourselves. I think that is something we have to understand. But the basic issue is, I think the US 
has set really the gold standard for selfishness in terms of vaccines or public health policies in the world at the moment, because it's not only not giving vaccines to others, but it is not even allowing others to manufacture or increase their manufacture. And I think that's a very, very damaging position for the whole world. Absolutely. And this is, of course, in addition to the millions of doses of AstraZeneca vaccine, which the US has not even sanctioned, but is holding on to and refusing to export. Prabir, in this context, I also wanted to ask you about the you know, huge amount of hype that had happened recently when the Quad had met India, Japan, Australia, and uh, the United States and leaders had met and they had talked about vaccine diplomacy. There was a plan in which India was supposed to play a very crucial role as the vaccine supplier and they were all supposed to work together. But right now we see that none of this is in the picture as the US has clearly said that we're not going to allow uh, these materials to go, the necessary materials to go to India unless all our needs are met first. So uh, was that all just hype or uh, was this not really predicted or what? You know, India has the capacity to manufacture 120 million doses per month. If raw materials and other things come, probably that could be scaled up to something like 150, 160 million doses per month. Uh, if we take Serum Institute itself, they said they can do 1.2 billion doses a year, 100 billion doses per month. And that if it's also orders are there, they have investments coming, then they can even ramp it up to 2 billion doses. So there have been various statements been made. But if we look at what the capacity is, then yes, Serum Institute has always claimed that if it had got the money, then it would have scaled it up to 100 million doses much earlier. But the restriction at the moment is not the money. Yes, money, now the Modi government has given some money, but the real restriction at the moment, which Adar Punawala has said, seems to be the, the constraint of raw materials and intermediaries that you intermediate goods that you require. So that is one part of it. The second part of the quad miscalculation seems to have been that India had controlled its epidemic, therefore a slow pace of vaccination in India with 60 million, 70 million doses till the US requirements are met. Don't forget we also have Bharat Biotech which has a certain capacity. So that pace was enough and India could supply some to the rest of the world while vaccinating its own people. The bottom of that has been knocked out now by the huge spike that we are seeing and what people are calling a typhoon, uh, whatever you want, uh, word you want to name. But the real issue is that given the fact that we are still seeing a steeply rising curve of new infections, it's clear that the, we have not reached the peak of this wave. So the flattening, and even when flattening will take place, it will take some time before it comes down. Given all of that, it is very clear that India is not in a position to pro provide vaccines to others for the time being, unless it is able to step up production capacity considerably. And there, of course, the Modi government, without doing that, making grandiose plans to compete with China, actually has knocked the bottom out of its own uh, claims to be a competitor because China has controlled its uh, uh, pandemic and it is vaccinating people as well as exporting. That export and vaccinating, vaccinating its people simultaneously is possible because they have been able to control the pandemic. The Indian government actually believes its own propaganda that we have controlled the pandemic, pandemic is gone, it's all over now. Therefore, a slow rate of vaccination along with export is possible. And therefore, the court statement that you refer to, where India becomes the vaccine supplier, Americans with a much bigger capacity to manufacture vaccines do not offer any vaccines. That is not for the rest of the world. That's for them, maybe for their allies, but certainly not for the uh, global south. The third world can survive on American, not on American vaccines, on uh, um, Indian vaccines was the basic idea. And then the Japanese and Americans would give money. Australia, because it neither has money nor vaccine capacity, would then provide the logistics was the argument. But the linchpin of that was Modi's belief, uh, Prime Minister Modi's belief that India has controlled the pandemic like China has, 
and now can follow and compete with China, 50% export, 50% for its people, or 60, 40, whatever you want to have it. And therefore, India would be able to compete with China. The other part of it, and this I think is the bigger tragedy for India, is that we had a starting capacity which was larger than China's, perhaps, for vaccine production. I'm looking at the figures that are there globally. Of course, the World Health Organization never really procured vaccine from China or Russia. They procured vaccine really from either the Western companies or from India. That has been their trajectory till now. And therefore, we really do not know what the Chinese capacities are fully. But th there is no question that China has the ability to ramp up production very rapidly. And that is because of two things. All the intermediaries, other stuff that is required in production, China seems to already produce. So because they are the manufacturer of the world, as they are called, so they have that capacity to ramp up production quite rapidly. So they have made investments. They have expanded their production. They have licensed their vaccines to a number of internally, number of companies. And therefore, the, though the, initially there were smaller companies, unlike, for instance, Serum Institute, which has a big capacity, one of the largest in the world, probably the largest in the world. Therefore, they, those companies, which were relatively not as big, but they, with investments, with support, they could ramp up production. And they don't have the kind of constraints that we seem to have. That is, we need support materials from the United States for our manufacture itself. So that was one issue. The second biggest, and I think that has been a cardinal mistake, that India should have actually tried to expand vaccine production and not decided that the market knows best, the private players will do everything. All we have to do is to tell them, you produce, and that will happen. And this is what Modi calls a self-reliant India. He calls it Atmanirbhar, because the minute you call it self-reliant, it smacks of Nehruvian socialism. So therefore, you know, the BJP is not fond of Nehruvian socialism or terms like self-reliance. But the belief that private capital will solve all the problems and the market will take care of all the issues with a cardinal mistake when you come to public health. And that's what comes up now, that you needed money. These companies needed money. They needed technology. They need government support. The US has done that. You know, the US understands capitalism very well. It knows that others should be talked about, others should be taught free market. When it comes to itself, it has always said state has to intervene in these kind of issues. In fact, it intervened in the polio vaccine manufacture very early. That was actually one of the test cases where the free market initially failed. And Eisenhower and his government then said, we will procure and supply the vaccines. And that's how polio vaccines were procured in the United States. And that's, a, you know, how many years back? This is in the 50s. So that cardinal lesson that public health doesn't work like this is was simply lost. And so you have a situation now that you don't, you have a constrained vaccine supply, you're not able to supply your own people, and then you have declared even worse, you have declared laissez-faire for the vaccines, government will procure 50%, the states and the private hospitals and the private market, the open market will knock at the vaccine manufacturer's doors to get whatever scarce vaccine is left. The big, the, as I said, the issue was, for instance, your Bharat Biotech, which is manufacturing a vaccine, which came out of the public sector. It came out of National Institute of Virology from the ICMR. Now, why could not have that been licensed to another six, seven manufacturers, both private and public? And there's seven public sector manufacturers in India who are idling at the moment. And one of them, for instance, Hafkin Pharmaceutical Unit, is a very old one. It started with uh, in the 20s, 30s, a part of the Hafkin Institute. It is still one of the largest suppliers of oral polio vaccine in India. Now, given all these capacities you had, you didn't go that way. And there are another 10, 15 companies, including major biologicals, who all can manufacture vaccines. In fact, they are lining up to manufacture vaccines, for instance, Sputnik V or uh, the uh, Gamalia Institute's vaccine. Now, all of them have the ability to manufacture vaccines. Now, why this should not have been expanded much earlier 
is something that I'm not able to understand, particularly when we had the inactivated virus uh, vaccine, which is what was developed by National Institute of Virology. This is what actually Sinovac did. The public sector developed the vaccine, gave it to a number of units to manufacture. And that's why they have been able to ramp up their manufacture. This is CanSino, Sinovac, Sinopharm, all of that. These are Chinese, basically public sector uh, driven vaccine manufacture, vaccine development, which then gets farmed out to a number of smaller companies or bigger companies, whatever. So why that method wasn't followed is not clear. And we see the crisis today that even if we start investing in all that we are saying, this will take three to six months before we can ramp up our vaccine manufacture. In the meanwhile, the US is putting, has put its foot on the pipeline of intermediate uh, goods that we require for vaccine manufacture, the Johnson & Johnson tie-up, and then you have a tie-up of uh, Serum Institute with Novavax and with, uh, as, as well as of course AstraZeneca, as we know. Both these vaccines are going to be constrained if these are not lifted. Absolutely, Prabir. So in this context, finally, just wanted to come back to a point you just earlier into that, which is that there's not been too much uh, procurement by the WHO of the Chinese and Russian vaccines. So is there any particular reason considering that across the world, there is still a huge demand for vaccines? Of course, China and Russia have exported considerable amounts, but it has not really been under the WHO ban. Well, one thing is China has exported a significant amount. Russia relatively less, because I think Russian capacity, production capacity is a lot less than India or China's or South Korea. South Korea is also a major manufacturer. So Russians are now targeting India and South Korean manufacturers to step up production. So Indian manufacturers, I think, were hesitant because government of India had not given emergency use earlier. Now they have given emergency use uh, to also Sputnik V. So I think now we are going to see India step up. South Korea also a bunch of manufacturers have got together to step up the vaccine manufacturing production. But you know, it's going to take time. This is not going to happen instantly. And in fact, that's the grouse I have against the Indian governments not uh, putting in the extra effort to start manufacture earlier, both investment planning, looking at supply chain, all of that, and also funding. But when it comes to China, China is the only one which is able to continue vaccinating its people and expanding production as well as export. So India has virtually taken itself out of this race at the moment until we ramp up production to a level that we can actually vaccinate our own people plus export. I think we have to see, we, we will see that India's exports will take a knock. As you know, in the last uh, two weeks, we have seen actually drop in vaccination figures instead of rise. So already you can see, we seem to have reached some kind of a bottleneck. Coming back to why WHO is doing this, this has been an old issue. While the Trump administration said WHO has been captured by China, the issue was really the opposite. It's really the Gates foundations and different kinds of uh, foundations, which are all US foundations. They have been deeply entrenched in WHO. In fact, the Gates Foundation provides is one of the biggest funders of WHO itself. So apart from that, in this particular case, the vaccine platform, which is supposed to lead the COVAX uh, part that you were talking about, that is actually controlled by two foundations, two organizations, which are again, both deeply, I will not say captured, but deeply influenced by Gates and his money. Bill Gates and the Melinda Gates Foundation. So the Western influence on this has been quite significant. And the Chinese, I think, therefore didn't want to butt their head against the WHO. They, were, they have done it on their own. They're having bilateral deals and doing it on their own. The Russians are keen to get into WHO. They, therefore, they, I think they are trying to see whether they can be uh, Approval can be given by WHO on their vaccine. The Chinese also probably at the moment have also asked WHO whether their vaccine would qualify, what are the things they would need to do. So the process is on. 
but at the moment it doesn't look like who is moving very fast on this i think they're very afraid that if they take any chinese vaccine they will be again accused of being pro china as we saw the attempt of the uh, experts who came and said it's very unlikely there was any weaponized uh, virus that came out of wuhan or a leak from wuhan and they gave various reasons why that is so but you could see the reaction and the, the who director general saying no 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 all options all uh, the yeah. hypotheses are on the table of course everything is on the table the question was the experts claim about likelihood so i think the who is scared of being again attacked on the china front and therefore they have been very very uh, quiet on chinese vaccines whether the russian vaccines will get through open question if for instance the european uh, regulatory organization accepts the russian vaccine then i think who might follow suit but on their own will they do it is an open question but at the moment the long term prospect for rest of the world is quite bleak if you look at what are called the low income countries you will see they have hardly any vaccine to manufacture africa has none is 1.3 billion people covax cannot supply them and the covax supply was going to come from as uh, from the serum institute then what do they do and that is something which should haunt the world because if they if we cannot address uh, the pandemic across the globe then mutants will arise and this battle will be every year we'll have to battle a new mutant and a new pandemic push i think that is the threat that we all carry and we can already see what condition india is in at the moment no oxygen so oxygen is not available crematorium is not able to handle dead bodies and that's the you know the hospital icu beds are not there so this is a the repeated crisis of this nature is what the world will face if you are not able to vaccinate the people at one go at one time in one phase so that one particular mutant new mutants don't arise and that's the risk that we are now carrying the new mutants are arising in different parts of the world and if we do not vaccinate all the people at a reasonable point of time then this this cycle of new mutants and you know a surge and vaccination will continue right. thank you so much for being for talking to us that's all we have time for today keep watching news clip